Hi, my name is Eva Nogales. I'm a professor of molecular and cell biology at UC Berkeley, a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator and a senior faculty scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And today I would like to give you an introduction to what is my favorite visualization technique to see cellular and molecular details in biology. This is electron microscopy. In my lab, we use this method to visualize processes of cellular self-assembly and molecular machines that are involved in nucleic acid transactions. And I will be using some of these as examples. I'm going to start by giving you an introduction to the physics behind how electrons interact with matter, how the electron microscope is able to generate contrast and visualize your sample, and then give you examples of biological um, uh, molecules and cells uh, and how the images are generated, how they look, and how we go into further processing to learn more about a structure and function in cell biology. So the first thing that I would like to tell you is that electron microscopy comes in two very different flavors. Um, SEM or a scanning electron microscopy um, is a method that uses focus beams of low energy electrons to raster along a bulky object and give you a low resolution rendition of the surface of the object. So this is an example of such an image. It's a crab larva and it looks very pretty because it has added false color. But there's no, elect uh, there's no color whatsoever in electron microscopy, so that's the first thing that you have to remember. This is more like the real image in an electron microscope. Let me give you another one. This is of dust mites. These are nasty things that cause uh, allergies. Certainly they do on me. And I want you to pay attention to the scale bar here, which is 200 microns. Uh, this is about the size of, of these uh, organisms. You can certainly crank up the magnification in this type of uh, microscopy and get to visualize individual cells. So this is an image now of a mouse oviduct. And this kind of tissue has lots of cells that have these uh, cilia that are used to create fluid uh, motion and allow the sperm and the egg encounter one another. Notice that the scale bar now is 200 microns, so we're really seeing cellular details right now. Uh, I would like to concentrate from now on in the other electron microscopy technique, which is transmission electron microscopy, or TEM. Um, this uses very different principles uh, and what it gives you is uh, projection images at much higher resolution of thin samples that are introduced into the microscope and there's possibility here to get even to atomic resolution as I will tell you in a second. So this particular example um, comes from a section that was taken from the flagella of an sperm, the one that could have been coming up the oviduct that I showed you before. So in this section, what we're seeing is the axonym, a structure that um, goes all the way along the flagella, is made up by microtubules, um, which are organized into this beautiful uh, structure. Now, microtubules are made by self-assembly of the protein tubulin. And you can actually purify tubulin, typically from mammalian brain, like cow brain, and reconstitute the process of microtubule assembly in vitro, in the test tube. And this is now a TEM image of such individual microtubules. And this image now contains information at the atomic level. Um, the scale bar that in the image that I showed you before was not microns, was nanometers. And what you see here, the thickness of one of these microtubules is 250 answers or 225 nanometers. In fact, this methodology has been used to obtain information on the structure of the tubulin protein itself. And what I show you here is a density map in blue um, inside the protein molecule, where these uh, yellow lines represent the polypeptide change going along it. And every, every one of these squares in blue correspond now to one Armstrong. Uh, so the resolution here is much higher, it's at the atomic level. So I'm going to give you more examples from microtubules, which are one of my favorite biological samples in a minute. But before that, I want to go back 
to very basic principles of how electrons interact with matter. In the transmission electron microscope, electrons have very high energies of the order of hundreds of kilo electron volts. That means that they are moving at close to relativistic speed. They're moving so fast that sometimes they basically go through matter without even noticing. So in here, what you can see are electrons going past an atom and some of them just go through and simply don't interact. They don't see anything. Some of them, uh, and these are very important for generating the image, are going to go through and bounce off the nucleus of the atom and be bent. This is a process of elastic scattering in which electrons don't change energy, don't change its speed, but change direction. And this is what we call the good scattering and is going to be used to generate contours in the image, in the TEM. Unfortunately, there's another process of scattering, the bad scattering. And these are electrons uh, in your primary beam generated in the microscope that go through the atom and interact with the electrons in your sample. And in doing so, they lose energy of their own and they pass it to your sample. These inelastically scattered electrons are going to only contribute to the noise in your image while at the same time really damaging your sample. Okay, so the TEM um, is going to be able to visualize your sample by using these scattered, elastically scattered electrons to generate contrast in the image. And the way this is done is uh, in two different manners. Um, the first type of contrast is called amplitude con contrast and is the one that is used to visualize sections of cells. Like this one, this is a section through the root of a maize plant and you can see the variety of internal organelles in here. Uh, amplitude con contrast works very much like an x-ray that you get at the doctors where more x-rays are being absorbed by your bones than by the rest of your soft tissue. So the bones appear darker in the image. Um, actually, what I'm showing you here is the positive of the image. What the doctor shows you is the negative, which looks like this. Okay, so in the microscope, um, in the TEM, electrons can be either absorbed by the sample or otherwise they can be elastically scattered and then we can remove the elastically scattered electrons but means of an aperture. Uh, the aperture is placed after the objective lens and what it does is it allows the unscattered electrons to go through but it blocks the elastically scattered ones and that generates contrast in the image basically making regions where lots of scattering happen because there's more density appear dark and regions where there was less scattering appear bright. This type of um, contrast is great to visualize um, sections of cells, but it falls really short when you're trying to get high resolution information on proteins and other macromolecular complexes. Um, so for that, we need phase contrast. And this uh, is the contrast that is generated in this type of images now of purified um, protein and protein complexes. In this case, the objective aperture of the microscope is utilized to make the scattered, elastically scattered electrons and the unscattered electrons interfere, uh, generating contrast in that manner. Um, this is based on the principle that relativistic electrons basically can be seen as waves and that when they go through matter, the wave front will uh, suffer a phase shift and this is what will ultimately cause the interfere when, uh, interference when mixed with the unscattered wave front. I'm not going to go into any more physics, rather I will now show you how an electron microscope looks like. Okay, this is what I would call a middle of the range electron microscope. Um, it is start, the whole story starts up here with the electron gun, which is where the electrons are produced. They shoot down the column, which is maintained at very high vacuums so as to minimize the scattering of electrons by residual air. Um, at each stage, you have electromagnetic lenses that are used to deflect the path of the electrons. Uh, earlier on, there's two condenser lenses, and these uh, control the illumination of the sample, how bright and how large is the area that is being illuminated. And then comes the most important lens, in the scope, which is right in the middle, is the objective lens. This is the one that will 
combine the scattered and non-scattered electrons to give you contrast in the image. And the other thing that happens right here is that's where the sample goes in. Uh, in this case, this is a cryo sample that is being maintained at liquid nitrogen temperature by being in contact with this dewar with liquid nitrogen. So after the objective lens come a, a number of intermediate lenses that are utilized to change the magnification from 50 times to something as high as 400,000 times. Uh, the image can then be observed in a phosphor screen uh, directly on a TV and ultimately recorded for further data processing uh, either on photographic film or on a CCD camera. The one thing that I would like to show you is an electron microscope grid is right there on my finger. Um, this metal grid is covered by a thin uh, layer of carbon and then the sample goes in there and we need, we need extremely little amount of sample. So we use um, say for purified comple uh, protein complexes concentrations that are on the nanomolar sub, sub micromolar range and we use a very small drop the size of a small tear that goes right in there and then gets plotted to a thin layer before it's very quickly frozen. The grid, um, all of this is done and the liquid nitrogen or nitrogen gas and then uh, in a holder and then is introduced in the electron microscope. But with very, very little sample, we can get, uh, still get uh, millions of occurrence of the complex that we are interested in and take many, many images and hopefully get to the structure we need. I get often asked what kind of resolution can the TEM reach? And in fact, microscopes like the one that I show you is capable of obtaining images with atomic detail. This is such an example. This corresponds to a thin nanocrystal of silicon where each one of these atoms, each one of these dots is, are actually atoms that have been visualized in this image. In fact, a state-of-the-art electron microscope can reach resolution beyond a single, atom, a single Armstrong. So very high resolutions are achievable as long as the sample is not radiation sensitive. So this sample was able to withstand thousands of electrons going through it in each square Armstrong in the sample without damage. Unfortunately, that is not the case for biological material, which is extremely sensitive to radiation. It was only a few years ago that people thought that high resolution information from biological materials would never be reached because the sample will vaporize before images were finally collected. Um, if that had been the case, I would be very sad, would not have a job, and I would be not talking to you today. But fortunately, there are more than one way in which we can trick nature and obtain high resolution information from our biological samples. So let me review with you what the problems are that are unique to biological organic samples. First of all, all biological material lives in aqueous solution and by definition they hate the high vacuum in the column of the electron microscope. The other thing is that the atoms that biological materials are made of, nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, have basically the same scattering power as the water that is surrounding them. So they basically have very low intrinsic contrast. And ultimately, and most importantly, they are very radiation sensitive. With, when inelastic scattering um, intra occurs, um, the sample gets ionized, generating radicals that then move around the sample and break all the bonds and basically make the whole thing explode. Okay, so how do we overcome these problems? There's two solutions. The first one to occur historically was uh, negative staining. In this case, your sample is embedded in a low concentration of a salt solution of a at very heavy atom, typically uranium. Uh, the sample is embedded in this, in this solution. The solution is then dried to a thin layer and introduced into the electron microscope. Because now there's no water, there's no problem with the vacuum, the heavy atom, the uranium, generates very high contrast, so we get over the second problem. And because now what you're imaging is this gas generated by the stain rather than the protein, you also reduce the problem of radiation damage. The protein may vaporize, but as long as the cast still reproduces its shape, we are okay. 
So, the big pluses of this methodology are the high contrast in the image and the fact that it's fast and easy. So Berkeley undergraduates can come to my lab and in a few weeks they're ready and taking beautiful images using this methodology. Uh, now, there are minuses, of course. The minus, the big minus, is that uh, artifacts are rarely possible. This is due to the fact that in some cases the stain cannot penetrate inside the protein or uh, cases where as you dry the stain, the protein, the protein structure may collapse. Um, even if you have very good preservation in some cases, uh, the resolution is always limited. It's limited because as you dry the stain, it forms little grains and that's the ultimate size of anything that you're going to be able to see, which is typically about 15 angstrom. So the solution to, to this, the second solution, optimized solution, is to look at unstained frozen hydrated samples. This is what we call cryo-electron microscopy. In this case, the sample is embedded in its aqueous solution where it is happy, uh, but then is very quickly frozen. It's frozen so fast that the water molecules don't have time to reorganize into a crystal, into ice, and therefore remain amorphous. We call that vitrified water. This um, to achieve vitrification, the samples have to be frozen very fast, typically a million degrees per second, and then kept at very low temperatures, tip, uh, the temperature of liquid nitrogen. If you do that, this sample can go into the electron microscope without evaporation of the water. So we um, avoid the problem of vacuum altogether. So the sample is hydrated, but in a solid state that can withstand the high vacuum. Now, because there's no stain, these samples do suffer from low contrast, and we're going to have to overcome that by other means. I'll tell you about that later. Um, radiation uh, sensitivity is limited because now the very low temperatures mean that radicals that were generated through the process of inelastic scattering are not able to move very fast. So that radiation damage is minimized, not eliminated, but reduced. So the pluses of this technique is that the preservation is extremely good because basically you have preserved even the aqueous layer that surrounds your protein. Uh, because there's no stain and there's no graininess, high resolution is in principle achievable. Um, in fact, in some cases, if you have the right experimental setup, you can even obtain time resolution. You can time a certain biological process to be triggered during the process of vitrification and trap intermediates. Now, minuses. This is a much more technically demanding technique. So undergraduates in my lab rarely get to a point where they are feeling very comfortable about doing uh, cryo-EM. It takes many months, if not years, to really master. Um, the other problem is the contrast, as I tell you. Um, there are ways of enhancing the contrast in the electron microscope, but they always tend to come a surprise. Uh, so mostly we deal with that computationally. The other problem is that although we have minimized radiation, it's still uh, the sample remains sensitive. So we have to use um, low doses, typically 10 to 20 electrons per Armstrong square, and that means that the, no the images are going to be very noisy. Okay, so let me give you an example how the the same sample, the same biological material, looks like in negative stain versus cryo-EM. So what you see here on the top is an image of a microtubule that is surrounded by rings that are made of a kinetochore protein. The kinetochores are the structures by which microtubules interact with chromosomes in a process called mitosis by which genetic material is separated. So here is that sample in negative stain, this is uranyl acetate that is generated to bring, uh, used to generate this very high contrast. Notice that the proteins appear white, while the stain around it appears black. The image behind is exactly the same sample, but now what you're looking at is just the contrast of the protein on a background of water. And the, the image appears a lot cleaner, because in here we can see every individual protein even those here in the background that have not self-assembled into these beautiful structures. Well, this in here is basically invisible. 
On the other hand, what we have really preserved very beautifully in the cryo -end image is the cylindrical shape of the microtubule and the circular shape of the ring, which allow us to obtain ultimately the structure um, in, in, in high detail and with high reliability. Okay, so let me now go back to the electron microscope to show you what is a true state-of-the-art TEM machine. All right, now this beast is what I would call a state-of-the-art transmission electron microscope. You can see that the column is both longer and wider. This is because the electrons that are being emitted by the electron gun have higher energy. As they are moving faster, they need bigger electromagnetic lenses to deflect them. Uh, this microscope has two special, very unique things. One is the sample goes here, this is what we call the stage, and this sample is being maintained at liquid helium temperature. That's very much close to absolute zero or minus 270 degrees centigrade. Okay, so that reduces radiation damage and also the whole mechanical stage uh, makes this uh, sample very, very stable and it makes a difference in the sample really doesn't move when you are taking the picture. Now, the other thing that is very important in this microscope and the reason why it is so tall that I have to stand on a ladder is that it has an extra piece right here. This is an in-column energy filter. It works very much like a prism, but for electrons. It spreads them out in a rainbow depending on their energy, and that allows us to filter out the inelastically scattered electrons that are contributing only to the noise in the image. This is particularly important when the sample that you're looking at are thick uh, sections of thick cells where the signal is going to be very low and the amount of inelastically uh, scattered electrons is very large. So this will allow it to clean up the image and be able to visualize things that otherwise would be invisible. Okay, this is a good time now to recap and think of the basic principles of um, how to generate images of biological materials. Um, in most cases, we start with a purified sample of your, bio, of your biological material of interest. This one is deposited on a substrate in the EM grid that I showed you before, typically covered with carbon, and is either embedded in negative stain or in a thin layer of vitrified water. Then we pass electrons through it, some electrons go right through and others are elastically scattered and will be the uh, interaction of the unscattered and scattered electrons that will give you an image in the electron microscope. But remember, although we start with a three-dimensional object, what the image in the TEM gives you is a two-dimensional projection of the object. Remember, this is not a surface like an SEM, it is a projection of the whole structure, but now compacted, if you want, into two dimensions. Things are really worse than that, because the radiation sensitivity of the sample means that we put in very few electrons to generate the image, and the image is really noisy. So this is the true data that we have to deal with. From here, from these noisy two-dimensional images, we need to get back the three-dimensional object in great detail. So how do we do it? Um, that is, uh, the details are going to depend on the type of sample, but typically involve a process by which many images of the object in the same orientation are identified, aligned, and averaged to recover the signal, so that now we have things that looks, look more like that. If we can get these type of images now, but of the object in different orientations, then they can be combined, combined for as long as we find out the relative orientation between them, to move from 2D to 3D and recover our structure. Okay. Uh, this process is what we call reconstruction. And how each one of these two uh, steps are carried out depends very much on what type of sample do you have. Okay. So one type of sample that is ideal but comes very rarely um, is that of two-dimensional crystals of proteins. In this case, um, the protein is a range in a single plane, in, a la in an ordered lattice that can extend for several microns with a thickness that is just a single protein. 
This kind of samples always falls in the same orientation in the grid. So in order to get three-dimensional information, it's absolutely required that you do what we call tilting. This means tilting the sample with respect to the electron beam so that we can generate different um, views of the object. Okay? This uh, tilting process is actually experimentally very complex and difficult. Uh, but when the data is collected, the computational processing is very simple. And it actually allows you to get to very high resolution fairly fast. This is because the image um, of this ordered array contains very high resolution information as can be seen in this electron diffraction pattern uh, from such two-dimensional protein crystal which is then to about three amps of resolution. Another type of sample that is really uh, very helpful and great for doing EM are helical arrangements. This can be naturally occurring or they can be artificially produced. Because in, in a helix, the molecule is in different orientations as, as you, process, you, know, as you uh, move through the helix. Um, you get different views that are related by the geometry of the helix. So no tilted is needed and you can actually obtain a full three-dimensional reconstruction from a single image, although initially it may have low resolution. Now, uh, this type of methodology is able to get between uh, medium to high resolution, meaning between 10 and 3 amps of resolution. And like uh, for crystals, um, the order in, in these structures means that in Fourier space, if you want, in the diffraction pattern, um, we have uh, reflections that are well separated and where filtering, um, I'm not going to go into details, but the filtering is equivalent of an averaging process. So the 2D uh, classification and alignment and the three reconstruction are very trivial computationally for both of these two samples. However, the most general type of biological sample is not going to be a two-dimensional crystal and is not going to be organized into a, into a helix. In that case, the type of reconstruction that we do is called single particles. Um, typically, these objects um, are going to be randomly oriented in your EM grid and no tilt will generally be needed. Um, the type of resolution that you get is going to depend on the type of sample. Um, for objects that don't have any internal symmetry and that may have floppy regions, the resolution may be very low, of the order of a, a few uh, nanometers. While um, for objects with internal e symmetry, like is the case for viruses, the resolution can be very high, all the way to three or four Armstrong. In these cases, uh, where there's no supramolecular arrangement, the computation is really heavy. It takes a big toll on the data processing. So let me show you some examples. Let's go back to microtubules. Microtubules are an example of cytoskeletal self-assembly into helical structures. As I told you, microtubules are made of alpha-beta tubulin, which are these represented here by these dark and light um, cubes. They associate uh, longitudinally, making what we call protofilaments, and these associate in parallel, making the, the wall of the microtubule. Uh, from images like this, of this structure, using helical reconstruction procedures, it is possible to obtain structures like this, where each one of these um, um, correspond to a tubulin molecule, and you can see details on the secondary structure, the architecture of the molecule one at a time. Um, it so happened that in the case of tubulin, you can trick it to self-assemble into something different, where protofilaments are still form, but they are associated in an anti-parallel fashion uh, where the structure doesn't close into a tube, but rather it grows into what are, can be considered two-dimensional crystals. These are the ones that produce these beautiful diffraction patterns that I show you due to the high order um, in, the, in this polymer. And from here, it is possible to obtain atomic resolution information. And that's where... Um, uh, uh, ribbon diagrams like this that now describe the path of the tubulin chain uh, could be obtained. I just want you to notice that this was obtained in the presence of Taxol, which is here shown in yellow. This is an anti-cancer drug that is used 
to bind to tubulin and stabilize microtubules, make microtubules very stable. And that is stops the process of cell division and it's, it stops in particular cells that are dividing very fast, those being cancer cells. Typically, microtubules are very highly dynamic and microtubules um, had been the object of cryo-EM study to describe actually how the process of assembly and disassembly take place. So what I'm going to show you now is a short animation that describes in a very graphic way how we think microtubules undergo process of assembly and disassembly based on cryo-EM structure of the intermediates that are generated in the process. So this is a microtubule that has reached a critical state um, where it's going to lose its stability and it's going to start depolymerizing. This is the tubulin structure that I showed you before um, so that you have an idea of how it arranges into the microtubule. The microtubule breaks down actually by peeling and curving of individual protofilaments. The peels are so normally very short-lived. They break apart and they depolymerize into individual subunits. But we were able to trap them bio biochemically and in order to obtain the structure of tubulin in that conformation. And what we found was that tubulin subunits are not only interacting with their kink, but they are kink internally. And that um, is what makes it impossible for them to remain stably in the microtubule. As a molecule of GDP is exchanged for a molecule of GTP that re-energizes the tubulin molecule, it straightens it up and allows it to now form both longitudinal and lateral contacts in what is, an, we believe, a structural intermediate in the process of assembly that is open and outwardly curved. We could again stabilize that polymer by means of low temperatures and a non-hydrolyzable GTP analog. And this is the structure. And what we saw was that protofilaments here are paired up. And within one pair, the interaction are just like protofilaments in the microtubules, but between pairs, this interaction has rotated. And as this thing grows, it eventually starts uh, rotating around that special interface so that it closes into a tube in a process that can be very highly cooperative by zipping up of the tube as the protofilaments straighten. So typically, you would have a microtubule that is growing by addition of tubulin subunit into an open sheet that then closes into a tube. And eventually, this microtubule will grow, will reach a critical step, and then will start depolymerizing. And assembly and disassembly will constantly occur as in the cell. Okay, so I showed you examples um, using tubulin uh, of how um, helical reconstruction or two-dimensional um, crystals are used uh, to obtain high-resolution information on sample. Uh, but in many cases, uh, we have to rely on single particle techniques because these higher-order structures are not available. So let me very quickly go through uh, the processing that will have to take place in a single particle project in order to get to the final structure. To start, remember that uh, we have our sample in embedded, uh, again, a purified sample, our molecules embedded in either a stain or vitreous water, that the EM image gives you a two-dimensional projection that is actually very noisy because of the low doses that we can use. Now from here, what we will do is we'll visualize each one of these occurrence of a, say, protein complex, and we'll pick them out and generate galleries like this uh, that shows our different molecules. These are showing the molecule in different in-plane orientation, but also different views. So what we, go, what we do computationally is we go through a process of aligning these images to each other and then classifying them. So eventually we put everything that has shows the same view in different classes and now these are ready for averaging and the averaging will give us now enhanced views of each of these orientations of the molecule. Okay? Um, these now have to be related to one another and this is a very tricky step that I'm completely going to um, uh, forget about for now. Uh, but ultimately, uh, this can be very computationally uh, involved, but ultimately, if the relative orientations of, this, of these different views are obtained, um, uh, we can go 
and reconstruct the object in three dimensions. Okay, so let me uh, now illustrate how do we go from the two-dimensional images uh, that we know are related to one another by defined angles to obtaining the three-dimensional reconstruction. We do that by something that is called back projection. So imagine now, this is a very simple example, where your object, your molecule, is made up by these three circles, okay? So when you pass electrons through it, you generate a two-dimensional projection that looks, say, like this, okay? And of course, um, you're gonna have this object in different orientations in your EM grid, which means that when you take different images, um, what you get is um, different projections that look distinct, and that by some means you're able to um, place one in relation to the other by finding the relative angles. This is tricky to do, but once you've done it, the way to obtain the reconstruction is to back project. Does that mean you take each one of these projections and you smear it um, and you see how all of them intersect reproducing the object. So this, I, I have another movie that is a little bit more fanciful because uh, Patrick, St. Patrick's Day is, is coming, the day that we're filming. So this, um, this is our object and what I want to illustrate here is how as we use more projections that are equally distributed, uh, we get more and more accurate representation of the object. Um, so this is a movie in which now projections are being added and the intersection is giving rise to, um, to this leap now in more and more detail. Okay, um, so let, let me now illustrate all of this with a real project. This is our study of the exosome, which is a molecular machine that is involved in processing RNA and in some cases in degrading RNA. And the exosome, in this case from yeast, from budding yeast, was purified and each one of these uh, blobs that you see here correspond to one, one complex, one image of the complex. And the complex is randomly oriented in here. And this is actually, by the way, a negative stain um, image. So all that I showed you up to now was cryo-EM, but this is an example of a negative stain study. So uh, if you go and pick up individual particles, this is how they look like. This is a gallery, they're pretty noisy. Um, but uh, going through the process of alignment and classification and averaging, you get now images like these that look, um, look a lot more well-defined. So the tricky part, which I'm skipping, is how each one of these images are related to one another. But once that was sorted, we were able to obtain a three-dimensional reconstruction. Just to tell you, we obtained two reconstructions, one of the full complex that is shown here, and one of a core element in the complex, uh, which structure had been obtained at atomic resolution by uh, X-ray crystallography of the human homologue. When we subtract one from the other, we get the core in blue and this extra region in yellow, which happened to be the one that has um, the biochemical activity, um, the site that actually chops the RNA. Now what is shown here is now the crystal structure of the human homologue of the core domain. And what you see here uh, in yellow are pieces that were taken from homologues found via bioinformatics. And what this allowed us to do was to create a pseudo-atomic model of how the top and the bottom part of this structure uh, interact. Now, um, this is actually a very common type of methodology. We refer to this as hybrid methods. And it, it involves the docking of crystal structures of components into the low resolution structure of the full functional complex. And this is something uh, that not only tells you how good your structure is, but also give you new information on, say, interfaces, how this bottom part and the, um, the top and bottom part interact, which elements uh, are involved in, uh, in that interaction. And in this particular case, it gave us the path of the RNA, of the RNA by aligning the uh, cavity in the top part with cavities that exist in the active region uh, that lead you all the way to the active site. Okay, so no matter whether the molecule that we were studying was in a two-dimensional crystal, in a helix, 
or was a single particle where many copies were utilized and combined to generate the structure, we were always looking at things where there were many copies of identical copies of an object. But what happens when we're interested in something where not two are the same? Like when we're interested in organelles or cells. What do we do here? Um, in that case, what we utilize is the method of electron tomography. Um, in electron tomography, the basic principle is all the views that are required to obtain a reconstruction have to be taken from a single object. Not from identical copies, but from a single object. So in here, again, the idea is we have a very unique sample for which there's no identical one, say an organelle of a piece of a cell. And what we're going to do is we're going to take many views of the object by taking this object and tilting it and always looking and shooting, uh, grabbing images from the same object, okay? And these, uh, the images will be obtained by tilting very gradually, typically about one degree, although how fine that division is made depends on the size of the object. Uh, in here, um, how these images are related to one another is very easy. It's just determined by you. You were always looking at the same object and you were the one uh, telling the microscope to tilt by a certain degree. So computationally, this is experimentally and computationally is very easy to obtain a reconstruction, which is in this case is again done by back projection. The difficulty here, as you will see, has to do with interpreting these images, which tend to be noisier and of objects that are really, really very complex. So we have utilized this kind of methodology in my lab to study yet another, another self-assembly system, and that is the one on septins, uh, which are proteins that self-assemble and make um, uh, filaments that actually lines uh, particular sites near the membrane in the cell at the position where cell division is going to take place. Um, we study septins in the organism where it was first discovered, with e, which is the bad in yeast. And uh, what we are interested in when we look at these cells is just the particular region here where our filaments are formed and where we want to see how they are organized and how they are interacting with the cell membrane. Okay, so the first thing that we do is to collect a tomographic tilt series where we place the object in the electron microscope, decide what it is that we're going to shoot at and then take images um, uh, once for every tilt of one degree. And here these, are, these images are showing just one right after the other. So this doesn't correspond to a reconstruction yet. This just show you one after the other the images of a very thick section where it's very, very hard to determine what is, what is in there. So after these tilt series are used in back projection, we can generate the reconstruction. And I'm going to show it to you as a series, as a contest series of slices going in and out several times uh, in the reconstructed section. Okay? So this is the section. We started at the edge of the section that we're going through. And I hope that you can see now that we see in much more detail as we go as, as we're going, each one of these speckles correspond to uh, ribosomes, and there's many of them in the cell. Uh, what you see here is the double membrane of, of a nucleus. Um, there's a lot more endomembrane here, and of course, uh, right by the edges is where we're going to see uh, objects of interest, which are this self-assembly of septins uh, into filaments um, around the membrane. So you can see the complexity of uh, reconstructions like this, there's so much going on. So in order to be able to look at it at once, what we do is we simplified this image, but just utili utilizing simple surfaces and lines to uh, trace through the surfaces of the plasma membrane, of the nuclear membrane, or the filaments uh, that we, we can trace from one section to the other. And we get uh, renditions like this by what we call segmentation. So this is now a very simplified view where we eliminate the things that we were not interested on, like all of the ribosomes. And what you see here in yellow is the pump plasma membrane is very curved because that's the side of the of the butt neck where the septation, the division of the mother and daughter cell is going to take place. Uh, this section included the, a nucleus that is also in the process of dividing 
with microtubules shown here in red that are pulling uh, chromosomes uh, apart. Um, there is more membrane that is internal that is shown here in kind of orange. Uh, actually, the thing that we were interested in looking are these filaments uh, that run in a number of directions. They run around a circle, if you want, in the back neck, but they also run between uh, daughter and sister cells. So they're the ones that we're showing here in green, the ones that we're showing in blue, and interestingly, there are also small filaments that we see in, uh, that are shown in red that are connecting the membrane to this filament system. So, just as a final note, imagine um, all the information that is containing, containing the tomogram that I just showed you a minute ago, where we only concentrated in this small section. Uh, it would be great if tomograms are made available, publicly available, just like uh, crystal structures or electron uh, maps of reconstruction so that anybody, irrespective of what you work on, can take, can make use of the image to follow and track the object of their principal interest. Okay, so this is the introduction that I wanted to give you of this technique and I hope that in this brief time I gave you an idea of the general generality of how applicable uh, this method can be all the way from individual mo molecules to visualization of the cell. And what I haven't time, have any time to tell you is that um, this method is far from being totally optimized and that there is a lot of development and improvement in the pipeline that is going to allow us to get not only higher resolution but a study even more system that right now remain really challenging. So by the time someone like you is ready to use this technique, things would have really moved beyond what I showed you today. Um, so I really cannot wait uh, for that moment myself.